The following audio drama is rated R and is recommended restricted for anyone under the age of 17. Hi there, and welcome to the Sonic Society, episode 463. I'm Jack Ward with... David Alt. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How are you, David? I'm very well, thank you. The sun is shining, and it feels like spring over here. Well, that's wonderful. It's It's been a bit cold out here, but it's more rainy cold as opposed to snowy cold, so it's not as much fun. Ah. Oh, yes. No, the thaw is never as much fun as the actual snow. Not that I've actually been in any snow properly but that's because i live over here and not over there well you're invited any time to come over and experience snow and ice i know thank you <laughs> have you gone skating on a lake or a river never oh well that's something you'll have to do right now it's march break in halifax and so it's an opportunity to do more writing and and more artwork here at evp do you have a march break on the other side of the pond we do yes we've got easter holidays mm-hmm. so this we, this year with easter being so early we're it's breaking up on monday thursday and then having a a two-week break our system is very much tied to the date of easter the easter holidays will either have uh, easter sunday falling right at the beginning if it if it's early or right at the end if it's late and i think something like the the, the latest easter can be is sometime mid-april and so easter holidays can either be from mid-march to the beginning of april or the beginning of april to the middle of april so it's quite a movable feast i, I, I was just going to say it's one of the bigger holidays we have in western society that's a movable yeah. feast isn't it yeah definitely it's mm. it's because it's got i think it's about six weeks oh. uh, in which it can fall it's true because it's Easter Sunday is the first Sunday after the first full moon after mm-hmm. the spring equinox. Right. So the earliest that could be is the 21st or the 22nd of March mm. if the Sunday is the spring equinox and a full moon. But then the latest it can be is if the full moon f- falls the day before the spring equinox, then you've got a full four weeks before that comes round again. And then if that falls on a Monday, then there's that extra week after that. So yes, five weeks that, you, that it can be. Makes me wonder if there's a position for movable feasts as dictated by astronomers. <laughs> that's, that's, that's when your occupation shines, isn't it? Telling us where things fit in celestially. <laughs> well, of course, if, you, if we're going to go down that route, then most people's star signs are wrong. <laughs> there you go. Right. Because the, the sun uh, now goes through... Right. Uh, the idea of star signs is it's where the sun was on the day you were born. Mm-hmm. But in the last 2,000 years... Years since it was uh, since it was the whole system was created, the sky has moved round by one twelfth, i.e., a whole month. So, uh, for example, I'm meant to be a Scorpio, but the sun was in Libra on the day I was ah, born. Ah, in other words, I'm an Aquarius, but I really should be a Capricorn. So there you go. That's that's a little piece of information. <laughs> there well something that is not a movable feast is the sonic society our (laughs) weekly show and tonight in this society we have how do you like that segue that was very good (laughs) tonight we have a packed show again this time with a new series called greater boston from alexander danner and afterwards the reason for our restricted rating is of course the fantastically hilarious friend of the show kyan chris conroy and he has a special super clip You know, Cayenne's made this clip from the best last 10 years of technical difficulties. And because it is a super clip, we'll be showcasing the rest of it in a feature all by itself next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. I know. It's almost as if the stars are shining on us. (laughs) Well, there you go. Right here. On the Sonic Society. What I love about Boston is that we're such a close-knit little city. Boston's kind of like one of those cities that's like, oh, yeah. They have history there, but we're so cute. I think we're a cute city. I don't know how else to say this, but I love being from Boston because it's like, you've heard about me, one. You've heard about us. Everybody hears about Boston. There's something like a clean, like an ocean taste to us, I guess. It's like when you eat a clam, it's like we're that clean. Braintree. Peabody. Haverhill. Lowell. All right. Fall River. Cambridge. Quincy. I can't see that one without a reason. Uh, Arlington. Arlington. Framingham. Newton. Lynn. Worcester. This is Framingham. Waltham. Quincy. Arlington. Waltham. Riviere. Somerville. Arlington. This is Lemonster. Haverhill. Brookline. Metro. Somerville. Cambridge. This is. This is. This is. Greater Boston. This week in Greater Boston, we meet three siblings. 
Baby brother Dimitri hunts the Sasquatch in part-time cryptozoologists. Middle child Nika rubs shoulders with celebrities in The Famous Bobbin Winder. And eldest brother Leon dies on a roller coaster in Disaster Planning. In Episode 1, Family Riddles. And now, a reading from the Big Book of Riddles by B.B. Bosco. A child was born in Boston, Massachusetts, to parents who were born in Boston, Massachusetts. The child was not a U.S. citizen. How can this be? What occurs once in every minute, twice in every moment, yet never in a thousand years? Which word in the dictionary is always spelled incorrectly? What can travel around the world while staying in a corner? What gets broken without being held? What always murmurs but never talks? Always runs but never walks? Has a bed but never sleeps? Has a mouth but never speaks? What is greater than God? More evil than the devil? The poor have it, the rich need it, and if you eat it, you'll die. What's always coming but never arrives? He who makes it has no use for it. She who buys it has no use for it. He who uses it can neither see nor feel it. What is it? Remember, page 113 has the answers. No peeking. Dear Leon, let me say it up front, you were right. The Sasquatch is a myth. I know that's hardly a surprise to you, and honestly, it's less of a surprise to me than you might suspect. My guides in my hunt were a pair of second-generation Sasquatch spotters. A rosy-cheeked husband and wife team, Timothy and Tiffany Ludlow. The Ludlows have spent their entire lives migrating through a circuit of cabins and camps in the wooded Northwest, ushered into their lifestyle by their own parents. They were a welcoming pair, self-appointed ambassadors to the Sasquatch Curious, always on the search for potential new initiates. I met them in a camping supply store where I was selecting the items for my camping kit. They were happy to offer their guidance on essential equipment and reliable brands, with further advice about good spots to camp and places to avoid. Is this your first time chasing Sasquatch? Tiffany asked. I had not volunteered that I was seeking the Bigfoot. I'd said nothing about it at all, only speaking of my intention to go camping, to get away from the world for a while, to seek myself in the woods. The Ludlows weren't fooled. They were attuned to their own. They saw Sasquatch in my body language, my tone of voice, the little things I didn't say. I laughed and made no effort to deny my true intentions. I needed their help, after all, so why be anything less than forthright? They invited me to join them at their camp, which turned out to be a grand enclave of beards and flannel, a dozen part-time cryptozoologists sharing resources, sharing meals, trading stories of their sightings and near misses, weaving in improbable details and unaccountably poor luck. They reminded me of Nika, these spontaneous storytellers, the way they were all so delighted to have an audience in their midst who hadn't heard their stories before. Do you remember after the hurricane when we were kids, how the power stayed out for days and Nika wove tales for us by candlelight every night before bed? And then the power came back on and we went back to watching television and playing our cassette tapes. And after three days of that, the power went out again. It only lasted a few minutes that time before Dad discovered that all the fuses were gone, stolen, hidden away in Nika's sock drawer, and Nika extravagantly wondering aloud how they could possibly have gotten there. These men were the same, in a way. A bald-headed insurance adjuster told of the time he spotted just the Sasquatch's hand resting on a fallen tree before withdrawing back into the brush. A portly line cook told of the fresh tracks he found in the mud behind his restaurant, leading from tree line to the dumpsters and back again. A diminutive shop class instructor told of the time he and his girlfriend were parked at camp when they were interrupted by an inhuman cry from the darkness. They all talked of how they would leave their day job someday, just as soon as they had the evidence they needed. The perfect film footage, the complete fossil, the living specimen. One day soon, their faith would prove out, and the world would acknowledge them. 
I lived with a rotating cast of these characters for the following six months, each of them taking turns as my guides and companions. They each had their pet strategies, their favorite spotting grounds, some favoring treetop lines, some spelunking uncharted caves, some preferring to simply walk the trails and count on serendipity to deliver the beast to their path. Serendipity never delivered. In the six months I spent searching, I never saw the least bit of convincing evidence, much though my companions tried to convince me otherwise. They showed me animal hair and footprints and broken branches, and none of it justified the claims they'd made. None of it resembled the miracles they'd imagined finding. Once, while perched in a treetop blind, I observed the Ludlows, hunting separately, each approach each other from the woods, close enough to see, but not recognize each other, each mistaking their spouse for something remarkable. That night at camp, they corroborated each other's stories. They had seen it in the same place, hadn't they? By the creek, something manlike, lingering in the trees, peering out at them from behind insufficient cover. They each spoke of being watched by something intelligent. They reported the same furtive, careful posture, timid and curious. They described the same eyes, knowing and generous and deserving of love. What else could it be but the Sasquatch? The other cryptozoologists devoured this story, added their own embellishments, how one of them had once found half a footprint in the mud by that same creek, another had picked up the scent of Sasquatch's distinctive musk. They congratulated themselves on this great discovery, this great step forward. They opened beers and box wines and they celebrated. I said nothing of my observations from my own vantage of how I had seen them discover nothing but their own selves. I knew I was done then, but I said no goodbyes, reluctant to explain my loss of faith, my exit from the congregation. Disillusionment has never been a gift worth sharing. That idea probably makes no sense to you, does it, Leon? The truth had been laid bare, the mystery dispelled. That would have satisfied you. More, that would have relieved you. But I was never there for the Sasquatch, Leon. I was there for the mystery itself. That was what drew me. Had I failed to draw a conclusion, I could have happily stayed in those woods for the remainder of my life. Do you remember that book of riddles we shared as boys? They weren't difficult to solve, especially for you. You saw the logic of them, plucked solutions from the nuances of phrasing like an angler pulling fish from the sea. But they got harder as we got deeper into the book. Took you longer to puzzle out until eventually they began stumping you entirely. You sat and thought, five minutes, ten minutes, fixated, but quickly giving into frustration, you snatched the book from me, flipping to the answers at the back, only to find that I'd carefully razored those pages out, tossed them away days earlier. You lost interest instantly, but I continued reading riddles out to you, tormenting you with unresolvable conundrums. I wasn't interested in the answers, only the questions. The riddles I liked best were the ones we couldn't solve. After leaving camp, I hitchhiked to Portland, feeling ready for a few weeks of comfortable living. A hotel bed, a long shower. The hotel was a hotel. The bed was a bed. The water was wet. After four days, I was roaming the streets looking for signs, omens, miracles. I walked down to the pier to see the ocean, those vast alien fathoms. The depths have always comforted me. That's where I met the man who owns a submarine. Dear Leon, by the time you receive this letter, I will already be gone, down beneath the waves in the company of submariners. I will write you again as soon as I can. Until then, I offer you a mystery. How much of our world has been lost to the ocean? What might still be there? With love, Dimitri. In Somerville, your one-stop shop for all your sewing machine and vacuum repair needs. Isaac Singer invented his sewing machine in 1851. 100 years later, Singer Sewing Vac opened its doors. That's 100 years of old sewing machines in desperate need of expert repair. Got an antique beauty? Bring it a Singer Sewing Vac today. Need some sewing help? Check out our popular Singing with Singer sewing classes. Work on your pipes while you pedal and stitch. This week, practice your Irish folk ballads while learning the fine art of the log cabin quilt block. Making your own clothes? 
If not, then you are missing out on the hot new trend that improper Bostonian called this year's thriftiest fad in hot couture. Don't cramp your fingers with needle and thread on that new pair of home-crafted designer dungarees. Stop in at Singer Sew and Back for your own vintage Singer today. Free extended warranty on all refurbished machines. So what? So whatever you want. That's what. At Singer Sew and Back, 280 Elm Street in Somerville. So you soon. I'd just like to thank everybody again for coming out to the Someday Cafe Open Mic Night. Up next, we have Nikas Tomatis, a regular at the Someday Cafe, performing one of her distinctive monologues. Hello. It's good to be here again. Some of you know me already. I certainly know some of you. Hi, Leon. My brother Leon, folks. Stop rolling your eyes, Leon. No, really, he's my biggest supporter, folks. He never misses a show. My name is Nika Stamatis. I'm a Somerville native, and I've decided to be famous. So that's what I'm going to tell you about today. I know it's not exactly a big revelation. I mean, I'm standing up here, right? You don't get many people who get up on stage to tell their stories without some kind of desire for public recognition. I think I've really got a shot, though, and I'll tell you why. Fame is drawn to me. It finds me, brushes up against me, jumps directly into my path so I can't help but trip over it. It started early in a video rental store on Martha's Vineyard where we were spending a week in a summer house. Not our own summer house, obviously. It belonged to a rich friend of my mom's, an old money molasses magnet she'd gone to high school with. And the summer house had a DVD player, which was very exciting. They weren't exactly new, but they were still too expensive for us to have one at home. So we took a trip to a rental store to rent some videos. While we were there, there was this other guy, a super tall guy, maybe like the tallest guy I'd ever seen, right ahead of us at the register. I stood right next to him, and after he left, my mom was all, Nika, did you see Chevy Chase? And I was like, who? Because I had no idea who that was, since he hadn't even done community yet. Well, someday, you'll remember that you met him, she said, and you'll tell your friends about it. So I guess she was right about that, you know, assuming that I can call you guys my friends. Anyway, I rented Five Will Goes West on DVD. Chevy Chase wasn't in that one. So then came a long dry spell. My high school didn't turn out many celebrities, though some of us tried. I played in a band, the Weimaraners. I figured no one gets more famous than bands, right? Well, maybe if we hadn't sucked, but we totally sucked. Uh, I played drums, and the other five guys all work at Olive Garden. And not even the same Olive Garden. They work at, like, five different Olive Gardens in five different towns, but all in New Jersey. Not to knock them or anything. I mean, all I do is fix busted sewing machines. Yes, if I seem familiar to some of you, that's probably where you know me from. The sewing and vacuum shop on Elm Street. I specialize in bobbin winder repairs. Anyway, my junior year, I got a job at Sew Buttons, that upscale thread shop on Newberry Street. The same shop where Matt Damon bought all the thread he used to make his tux for the Oscars the year that I worked there. The one with the blue fiber optic weave that flashed messages about water charities. But anyway, fuck if I ever met him. I started out on the sales floor trying to upsell trust fund students from premium cotton thread to artisanal distressed silk. But I'm total crap at sales, so I got shuffled into the back to maintain the machines. That's how I first started learning about sewing repair. A few years after that, my brother Leon went to college, only one of us to do that. I never saw college as a step along the path to where I was going. Our baby brother Dimitri practically lived at the library, like he even had one of those special library cards that lets you stay in the library overnight to keep reading, but he never had much patience for formal education. They're too focused on getting the right answers, he always said, like getting the wrong answer is something to aspire to. But anyway, I visited Leon a couple of times, which brought me to the office of Professor Frakes. Professor Frakes was an English teacher, and sometimes he drank coffee out of his son's head, which was weird, but not that weird, because lots of people drank coffee out of his son's head. His son was Commander William Thomas Riker, first officer on the Enterprise, and they used to make coffee mugs shaped like his head to sell at Newberry Comics. 
I never really watched Star Trek. That was Dimitri's show. But to someone like me, who just wants to be famous, you can't really beat the prestige of having a mass-produced coffee mug shaped like your head. So Professor Freaks was a pretty big deal in my book. So anyway, this one time, I walked into the office of Professor Freaks, and I tell him, Professor Freaks, there's a student open mic, you should come. And he just says, no. And then he scowls at me. The same way he must have scowled at his son when little Jonathan announced that he wanted to grow up to be a TV astronaut. And the longer he scowled, the more famous I knew I would someday be. After high school, I was friends with a guy who was making movies, and he cast me in one of them. And that's how I met Rob Zylowski. Rob played an evil clown, and I played his captive videographer. And at the end of the movie, the clown beat me with my own camera. Kind of a whole extreme shaky cam thing, until I coughed up a frozen meatball soaked in warm jello. That was supposed to be the special effect, like, if enough red sugar water dripped off the meatball, it would look like I had coughed up my guts after the beating. But mostly it still just looked like a meatball. That movie did not make anyone famous. But then, Rob Zylowski was in another movie called The Princess Diaries, and that movie did make somebody famous. Rob played the pizza guy, and a teenage Anne Hathaway played a princess, and Rob delivered a pizza to teenage Anne Hathaway's love interest. Rob didn't make the pizzas, he just delivered them. That was his dialogue. Because he had this crazy long skinny beard, like this six-inch tentacle of a beard that practically wanted to shake hands when it met you. So you wouldn't want to make in your pizza because he might get some beard in it. And then he left because he was just the pizza guy. But he gave Anne Hathaway's on-screen boyfriend a pizza. And I coughed up that meatball. So now that's me and Anne Hathaway linked at the metaphorical esophagus. And that brings me to today. Here, now, working at the sewing and vacuum repair here in Davis Square, which isn't all hoity-toity, trust fund glitzy like the place I worked on Newberry Street. But it's been around forever. And everybody knows that if you've got a serious machine in need of serious repair, you bring it to us. Like, like last week, Amanda Palmer brought in the very machine she used to make the bride's gown she wore back in her busking days when she was the living statue in Harvard Square. She handed that sacred machine to me, and she trusted me to fix it. And let me tell you, I repaired the fuck out of Amanda Palmer's bobbin winder. So that's how far I've gotten, and I think I must be close. Thank you. Um, do you know any good riddles? I don't even know what, what do you mean by, like, like, a little, like, fancy rhyme here? Like, what are you talking about? A riddle, you know. Yeah, there's one that I can't say. Um, that she saw one by the seashore. Oh, man, I always mess it up. What do you call a clairvoyant dwarf who's missing? Okay, what has four legs and then two and then three and then four again, I think? She, she sells, she sells by the seashore. A small, medium, at large. That's the only one I can remember. It's not good. I but. Like it. I like it. <laughs> when you're a baby, you crawl on all fours. And then when you're a man, you have two legs. And then when you're an old man, you have a cane, so three legs. And then back to four because you're dead? I don't know. She she sells. She sells. By the sea. So I feel like I'm repeating it. Like You know what? Maybe I told it wrong. I don't know. It's I'm a little confused. Um, yeah. You're in a house with no windows and no doors. All you have is a table and a saw. How do you get out of the house? You cut table in half, you put the two halves together, two halves make a hole, and you walk through the hole. Leon Stamatis died on a roller coaster at the age of 32. It was not a dramatic death. His car did not detach from the rails. His body did not loose itself from its seat. His death was quiet, unobtrusive. In that way, you could even say that Leon found the kind of death he'd always planned for. He'd had profound misgivings about boarding the ride in the first place. He'd never been an adventurer, not like his little brother Dimitri, who had disappeared into the mysterious labyrinth of the world, nor a thrill-seeker like Nika, who grinned wider for every inch the line advanced. It had been Nika who had goaded Leon into coming here in the first place, escorting him via the red line from Porter Square to Park Street, briefly boarding the green line to reach the government center connection, where they boarded the Stygian blue line, 
which ferried them mercilessly to its terminus, Wonderland. Once there, Nika insisted that the absurdly named roller coaster be their first stop, pulling him by the cuff of his sleeve. She had brought him out here specifically to cheer him up after the end of his most recent relationship. She saw not so much a responsibility as an opportunity to be useful, and Leon felt obliged to indulge her, to allow her that pride of having comforted a loved one in need. So he put on his smile, took deep breaths, and shuffled along the crowd control maze that guided him toward his destiny. He knew he could change his mind. It's not as though he had inscribed this into his schedule. The trip itself, sure, it was right there in his Google Calendar. Post-relationship outing with Nika. Destination, Wonderland. But nothing committing to the roller coaster. Certainly not some rickety monster called, good lord, Whirladon? And if it wasn't on his schedule, then he didn't have to do it. He reminded himself with every step. As he approached the polo-shirted teen with the child measuring rod, he reminded himself. As he stepped off the platform into the third car from the front, he reminded himself. But when the shoulder cage descended over his head, he realized he was too late. The appointment was confirmed. He didn't even mind so much that his relationship had fallen apart. He was more concerned about the precarious state of his job. He'd found the relationship stressful. Louisa expecting outings on a moment's notice, to movies, to dance clubs, all the way to the North End for Florentine cannoli at Mike's Pastry. It wouldn't have been so bad if only she had planned ahead, given him a month's warning? Maybe two? Heck, he liked North End, where the streets were permanently tacky from the Great Molasses Flood so you had to slow down your step just a little, or the sidewalks would pull your shoes right off. But Louisa sprang things on him. Cooking classes, and dinner reservations, and IMAX showings of documentaries about Antarctica. It was too much. The operator released the cars, and Leon was jerked forward. He laughed once, the way a condemned man laughs when he doesn't quite believe what's coming. Nika misunderstood gave him a nod and a grin. As the car rose, Leon began planning. He would keep his hands and arms inside the car, of course. He would not give up his one means of anchoring himself should the safety harness fail. There weren't any good handholds. Holding the harness itself wouldn't help. If the harness detached, he'd just have a good grip on it as they flew off into the atmosphere together. But there wasn't even a lap bar, since the five-point harness was expected to suffice. Leon was not so trusting. He understood the need to be proactive, to ensure his own security. That was why he'd begun job hunting, despite having a job in which he'd been content for ten years. The publishing industry was shrinking. He had survived the first round of layoffs, but he needed to be ready for the second. The cars clacked dragged forward by the chain through the ratcheting mechanism of the side rails. He understood that this was a safety system, an assurance that the cars could never fall backwards, simultaneously snapping the necks of every passenger on the train. Understanding made the sound no less ominous. Up they clacked. Up and up and up. He couldn't believe how far up, how long they ascended, whole lifetimes passing while Nika bounced in the seat beside him. He had never been good at anticipation. There was no joy in it for him, only the dread of uncertainty, the panic of surprise. As a child, he had refused to open his own Christmas presents, insisting that Nika and Dimitri do it for him while he waited in the next room with his eyes closed. His siblings reported back to him dutifully, carefully detailing what they had found. Most significant presents first, so as to ease the greatest anxieties, then continuing in order of diminishing value to end in the familiar safety of socks and number two pencils. Only once he knew every item, had assuaged all lingering mystery, would he dare to set eyes on the totems of affection his family had chosen for him. He discovered that if he stretched his arms far enough, he could hook his fingers under the bottom of the seat itself. 
The metal was filthy and unpolished in this unseen space. It cut into his fingers. He calculated dates to reassure himself that his tetanus inoculations were current. They were. So that was one less thing, at least. Tetanus was not among the uncertainties. Leon could bear no uncertainty. He was the sort who would gladly accept knowledge of the exact time and cause of his death, given the opportunity. He wouldn't even try to change that fate. The knowing would be enough. More than enough. Better than avoiding it only to land back in the limbo of uncertainty. He'd even applied for a position at an astrology magazine. Not because he believed in astrology, which he did not, but simply because he respected the art's goal. The complete elimination of the unknown. A life without surprises, without the unexpected, without unanticipated terrors. However much about the world changed, superstition would always be a constant, perhaps all the more so in times of upheaval. Just look at Dimitri, run off into the woods in search of implausible creatures, or Nika hanging her hopes on chance encounters with famous strangers. Yes, astrology was a counterintuitively solid post to which Leon could tie his ship. He thought about all of that during the interminable rise along the track, but soon enough all that time was reduced to a mere blip, the end come much too soon, as Leon saw the passengers in the head car raise their hands in the air just before disappearing over the zenith of the track, followed by the second car, and then there he was at the peak, looking out over the edge at a 200-foot vertical drop, followed by an array of twists and loops. He tried to make the calculations, to consider how best to turn his body or shift his weight or anchor his hands, but he knew it was hopeless. Whatever was going to happen would happen far too fast for any of his careful preparations to mean anything at all. Either his little pod would drive itself into the ground with crushing force, or it wouldn't. It would fly free of its rails. Or it wouldn't. It would kill him. Or it wouldn't. There was no solution to this puzzle, save to wait and hope. And now here was Nika tossing her hands in the air with no concerns at all. Leon just couldn't do it. He took one look from atop that rickety wave of track, that dizzying array of speed and surprise, and embraced the greatest certainty he could muster. He muttered a single word. Nope. Then preemptively expired. Willfully exited the world, without feeling even the first breeze of descent. Greater Boston is written and produced by Alexander Danner and Jeff Van Drusen, with recording and technical assistance from Mark Harmon. In order of appearance, this episode featured James Johnston as Dimitri Stamatis, Kelly McCabe as Nika Stamatis, and Braden Lamb as the voice of Leon Stamatis. Also featuring Alexander Danner as the narrator and the singer Pitchman, and Jeff Van Drusen as B.B. Bosco. Interview clips gathered from Greater Boston residents. Charlie on the MTA is performed by Emily Peterson and Dirk TV. The Tosa Waltz was composed by Michael Cassidy and performed by Emily Peterson and Dirk TV. Additional music by David Fernandez. If you enjoy Greater Boston, please consider donating to our Patreon campaign and help spread the word by leaving us a review on iTunes or social media. Greater Boston is written in part at the Writers Room of Boston, a nonprofit workspace for Boston area writers. Find out more at writersroomofboston.org. I have one sibling, we don't get along too well, and he likes football. And the strangest thing is um, he always comes into my room to steal my deodorant. I don't know why. He has his own. Is yours better? I guess, yeah. We, it's kind of the same brand, but different.
flavors. The year is 2000, and the future is now. Which is ironic, because this story is being recorded in 2010, which puts it squarely in our past, which at the time was our future. Our future that had arrived at the present, which is ten years in our past. Got that good, I'm not going over it again. But in our past, present, future, the future was now. But not the future as we knew it now, because that future was then, and this is now. But back in our past, the future was present. That is to say, the future was now, or then. But back in those days, the future looked bright, because in the past, the future was present. But here in our present, their past, our future, their present, perfect future, things were less than perfect. Or were they? Impossible to tell. The future always looks shinier from the front. Like a freshly minted penny. Bright, coppery, and full of promise on one side, and on the other, exactly the same. But what good would it do you? Even gumball machines don't take pennies in 2010. But in the year 2000, they didn't either. No, then, as now, pennies were only good for one thing. Change. The kind of change you could believe in. Exact change. If you put your two cents in and you had a nickel, you would get three cents back. Then you could put your two cents in again, but that would only leave you with a penny. And what could you buy with a penny? Nothing. Not even gum. But this was the year 2000. And if I had a penny for every one of those years, I'd have $20. But it would be very difficult to spend as it would all be in pennies, and no one likes to take that many pennies. On the upside, I could put my two cents in 1,000 times. And if I had a nickel for every time I put my two cents in, I'd have $50. More than doubling my initial investment. But hold the phone. This isn't the year 2000. This is the year 2010. I get another 10 cents or another five two cents in. At five cents a piece, that's another 25 cents. However, in the high stakes world of modern finance like today in the year 2010, no quarters are asked for nor given. You'll have to wait at least another 10 years for that to accrue properly to where you can use it. In the year 2020, that would be 50 cents, and that would be just enough to make a call on that phone you were holding just now. But I hear you say that that's the future, not the present. Ah, but you forgot what I said at the beginning. The year was 2000, and the future was now, which was then, which means that initial investment of your two cents in nets you an extra dollar. And I wish I had one of those for every time I said you were experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by. But of course, that's all in the past. And this is the present. Your present. Happy anniversary. What anniversary, you say? Why, the anniversary of technical difficulties. It was February 23rd, 2005 that the very first episode of this here podcast aired. And now, I should be celebrating the anniversary somehow. And here it is. How am I going to do that, you ask? Ho, ho, ho. Glad you asked. Or maybe not. What I'm going to do is, uh, well, I'm going to release some old material. Yeah, sorry about that. Actually, the real deal is I'm going to be out of town while, uh, the anniversary is happening. So I thought, you know, since I don't really have time to do a full-length show, I'd go back into some of the old archives and pull out some of the older material. Now, this is for a CD project that I've been promising for a really, really long time, which is going to be a whole string of professionally... <laughs> this is me we're talking about here, so use big quotation marks over the word professionally. Professionally produced uh, comedy culled from the old material. Um, rather than just re-release that material again, a lot of it's pretty sketchy in terms of its audio quality and my performances could have been better. But uh, I'm going to take the best material from all ten years of the show and I'm going to start releasing remastered, you know, redone, not remastered, redone. I'm going to redo all, a lot of the material from then and just put out some comedy CDs. I use the word CDs loosely. It'll probably be like Bandcamp or some, iTunes or something like that. Um, it means going through all that old material and... Uh, figuring out which ones I can do without using sound effects that I don't have the rights to and kind of the ones that I definitely want to do that I'll need the sound effects for if I want to put in the work of creating new sound effects or want to shell out the money to buy properly licensed sound effects to recreate them, which would run into some more money. But you get the general idea. I've been going through this for a while. But since I've been kind of lax on putting out new material and I am working on new material for the account, don't worry about that. It will There will be more soon. I thought maybe perhaps... Um, you know, I should go through the old stuff and release some, some new versions of old material. Uh, in the course of that, I thought, wow, this is 10 years of material and this is the anniversary. Why don't I just go back and remaster some old stuff and put that out uh, sort of as a celebration of the 11 years the show's been on? Lazy? Well, it's actually more work than you think. I did have to find all those files and bring them out and figure out a way to get the new garage band to open them without crashing, which it did several times, and uh, eventually I got it all nailed down. So I've selected a period that I was going through from around the 2009-2010, as you can guess from the opening, uh, from the opening bit there, and I've uh, sort of edited them together into a, uh, into a new long mega show, I guess. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. 
Uh, if you're uh, if you've gone over the show a new num- number of times, if you listen to the archives, this won't be new material, I'm afraid. But uh, it will sound better than it did before. I guess that's a plus. Uh, anyway, thanks so much for listening. If you've been listening to me from the beginning or any time over the last few years, thanks for sticking with me for as long as you have. Those of you who have been listening from the very beginning, 11 years of this, uh, What? why are you still around? What's happening? I don't understand. <laughs> Um, and if you're new to it, uh, this is a little taster of that kind of stuff. If you haven't gone back and listened to it before and you're just, or if you've just listened to the account or whatever. Anyway, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to post this here and, uh, before the anniversary because I figured why not. And then, um, again, I'll, I'll be back in early March with brand new stuff. So thanks so much. Um, happy anniversary to me. Happy anniversary to all of those of you who have listened, and just thanks so much for listening. I've repeated that several times, so I'm done here. So on with the 11th anniversary supercut. Coming soon. Captain, have you found out why we lost contact with the missile silo? I've got some bad news, General. When we broke into the compound, we discovered that everyone who worked there was dead. Dead? All of them? Yes. Are you absolutely sure? Yes, sir. I mean, really, are you absolutely sure? Did you go up and check their pulse, do uh, the thing where you put the mirror over their lips yeah. to see if they're still breathing, give them a kick in the ribs or something? So, so we checked. Yes, they're all dead. Okay. All right, all right. I just don't want this turning out like last time, that's all. A crisis the likes of which America has never seen has gripped our nation. General, I think I know what killed all your men. And it wasn't terrorists, assassins, or undercooked meatloaf. Damn, looks like I owe you $20, Captain. That's all right, General. No, sir, these men were killed by bees. Bees? bees? Yes, bees. Bees, nature's little fuzzy black and yellow death squad. Nature turns against mankind. Can you imagine it, General? A giant black cloud of death sweeping across the nation, filled with killer bees, aggressive, unrelenting, unstoppable. Death raining from the sky at the hands of 720 million bees. Good God. 720 million. That's right, General. It's a strangely specific number. Yes. Well, it is an approximate. There's probably some slop yeah. room on either side of it. Yeah, but how did you come to that number? Yes. I mean, you know, was uh, it like an acreage? Yeah, density, no, something, no, just, you know, per square inch? inch. How how loud Look, I'm just an expert on bees! I know, all right? Sheesh! Mankind's twilight at the hands of an unstoppable force. Now, hold on, Professor. That silo was 17 floors underground. How could the bees have gotten down there? Well, not through the vents of the silo bay. Those were too well protected. Well, how then, Professor? I think these bees took the elevator. 720 million bees took the elevator? Well, not all at once, obviously. They probably took turns. Technical Difficulties Films presents The Swarm of Deadly Killer Bees! Captain, we picked up something on the radar. It's a huge, dark mass heading north. That's it! That's the swarm right there! How long before it reaches Houston, Professor? How fast is the swarm moving? Uh, seven miles an hour. Good God! They'll be there in a week or more! That's not nearly enough time to warn them. All right, get the Air Force on the horn. I want all those military jets scrambled. Tell them to get out there and intercept those bees! Sir, those planes fly at sonic speed. What's your point, Corporal? Well, the bees are only moving at seven miles an hour. How will they intercept? Well, just tell them to ease up on the throttle a bit, I guess. Okie dokie. Swarm of deadly killer bees coming this summer to a theater near you. The world will end, not with a bang, but with a buzz. This week's episode of Technical Difficulties is brought to you by Thalidomide Strike Force, Flipper of Justice. All right, boys, grab some guns. It looks like the terrorists are trying to take the capital. We can't use guns. We've got flippers for hands. Then let's go out there and slap them silly. Thalidomide Strike Force, they slap evil silly for America. Have ow, some of this, ow, you terrorist ow, enemies ow, of freedom. Take that ow, and that. Ow, Come ow, on, ow, here ow, you go. Ow, have ow, some more. Ow. So you want some more? No, no, I don't. Well, have some anyway. Ow, ow, Keep ow, slapping him, ow, Chief. Ow, he hasn't gone ow, silly yet. Ow. Thalidomide Strike Force, Flipper of Justice. This from who the hell greenlit this productions? Whoa. All right, who the hell greenlit this? I, I don't know, Chief. Uh, it wasn't me. Don't look at me. I had nothing to do with it. It was uh, an older boy or something, or a big monster. I don't know. I specifically told all of you I wanted a low budget action movie in the vein of an 80s Arnold Schwarzenegger film. What the hell were you thinking? Well, we were trying to save money, boss. We just thought. Save that... money? According to this sheet, you spent 90% of the budget on makeup effects and CGI to make the lead actors look like they had little flippers for arms and legs. Well, and they didn't even look like thalidomide flippers. They looked like seal flippers. Well, if you look at the story, that's why they were specially chosen. They had these special legs and arms. Chosen by who? SeaWorld? And look at this next film you made. An adaptation of Wuthering Heights. Well, yes, that's one of our classic film series. A very educational and very literate. You had a bunch of teenagers staying overnight at Wuthering Heights and having Catherine's ghost killing them one by one with a circular saw. Well, it was a reimagining. Well, I'm about to reimagine you as a man who's just been beaten up by an Emily Bronte fan. Wait! Oh! Ah, take that! Ah! Oh! 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 Oh!
That'll learn you to mess with great literature. And that's a lesson for everyone, whether they're first graders or Hollywood producers. Not that I can tell the difference on most days, to be honest. So if you're going to adapt a classic novel to another medium like film or television, do us a favor and at least give it a quick read, why don't you? I mean, come on, they make things like audiobooks, you know? I mean, what else are you going to do while you're sitting around stuck in traffic? Uh, oh, for God's sake, here we go again. What's your problem, son? Are we stuck in traffic? Yeah, we should be through it in no time at all, Dad, so just sit tight and we'll be oh, out of this Oh, no, soon. son, you can't do that. Idle hands are the devil's plaything. I'll just Dad. go back into the back seat and no. continue building that scale replica of the HMS Terror like I've been doing. No, Dad, don't, Dad, don't do that. No, uh, come on, I brought an audio book. Come on, it's Charlotte Bronte this time. Uh. So what you're saying is your father would build things every time you got stuck in traffic then? Yeah, we lived in New York City. We got stuck in traffic all the time. I see. So was it always replica? Because of famous ships. Yeah, and they were all one sixth scale. It was hell getting him out of the back seat. Well, look at it this way. I mean, it's better than most people his age could say. He kept busy with a hobby of model building. His hobby was driving me crazy. Well, cut him a little slack, you know. I mean, not everyone gets everyone else's passions. I know, but I remember it's... my second wife had a problem with my collection of gravel that I thought looked like Ray Harryhausen film monsters. That always no. Drove you're not her getting up. this. Driving me crazy was his hobby. Oh, so it wasn't just the models then. No, it was everything. Every single thing that he did was designed to make me as nuts as possible. I mean, when I was twelve, he decided that I needed to learn to water ski, so he took me on a yearly trip to do that. Well, I mean... In January, oh. in the Mojave Desert. Oh. Okay, son, you got your skis on? Well, yeah, Dad, but there's no and water. And don't forget I mean... to wear your life jacket, son. That's what? important. I don't want you drowning. I know what? what a crappy swimmer you are. I'm a better swimmer than you are. I'm on the swim team. Drowning team is more like it, son. How would I... you know? You've never been to one of my swim meets, ever. Well, that's all right, son. I just didn't want to get in the way of any of your action, that's all. What do you mean, action? What are you talking about? Well, son, you hanging out with other boys your age wearing huh? nothing but Speedos? I've been around. I know what that means. Dad, I am not gay. Now, son, don't be a self-loathing homophobe. What? It doesn't become you. Unlike what? the captain of your swim team. If I'm any judge of horse flesh, and I'm telling you, you guys would make a great couple. I'm not a homophobe, and I'm not gay either. You've met my girlfriend, Angela. Oh, your beard, you mean. What? Which is probably for the best, since you'll never be able to grow a real one. Dad, so, we... y'all hitched up there, son? Good. I'm going to go fire up the boat. What boat? We'll... That's a pickup truck. That's not a boat, and I'm not hitched up to anything. You just tied a length of rope around my waist. Well, don't worry about it, son. Just keep your toes pointed together and keep your back flexed, and you'll do fine. Here we go. Okay, Dad. Look, joke's over, all right? I really don't think that Mom would approve of doing... What? So your dad was a bit of a prankster, is what you're saying? Yeah, in the sense that Sweeney Todd was a barber, yes. Well, how did you feel when you discovered your father had Alzheimer's? He does not have Alzheimer's. Well, his medical record says right he here. He does not have he... Alzheimer's. He wrote that there himself. The only reason he says he has Alzheimer's is so when I confront him about all the stupid things he's done to me during my life, he can turn around and say, oh, sorry, son, I don't remember that. It must be the old Alzheimer's flaring up again. So you don't have any children of your own, do you? No, and that's his fault, too. Why, did one of his little pranks go too far or No, something? nothing like that. I'd just be terrified to bring a child into this world and have someone like my dad as their grandfather. Well, I suppose. Besides, I have his genes. I'm afraid of what might have sloughed off onto me. Well, you know, Mr. Johnson, I think I can say safely that you are a pretty good candidate for therapy after this interview. You really think so? I mean, you think it could help me? Yes, I think a few one-on-one sessions would be very helpful in your case. Hmm. I mean, you seem like a rather together, stable individual. So, uh, I think that, uh, yes, we could probably do something with you. I could recommend a few books that you could read and uh, some techniques to deal with your anger. Great. And uh, probably also some other techniques to deal with your father himself when you actually talk to him. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, that is to say I would, but I'm afraid I'm not going to. Well, why not? Well, in order for me to do that, I would have to be a licensed therapist instead of the proprietor of a strangely quiet pet shop that you and I just happen to be standing in, so I can't help you. Well, I suppose that's okay. I couldn't really figure out a way to get out of that last sketch, so it's probably for the best. Yes. So, welcome to the Pet Emporium, sir. What can I do for you? Wow, it's strangely quiet in here for a pet shop. Say, you're right. Hang on. Yeah, that's better. Much. Now, yeah, welcome to the Pet Emporium, sir. Can I help you? Yes, I'm looking for an exotic pet. Well, what are we looking for? Something cuddly? Something deadly? You got something in between there? That's something sort of, cuddledly? Uh, cuddledly, yes. Cuddledly. Yeah. Is that a word? Uh... It's trademarked. Well, it's good thinking on your part. Yeah, it'll... That's uh... where the money is. So, cuddledly is what you're thinking of. Well, yes, I think I can help you there. How oh, about good. this? It's a Tasmanian koala. I didn't know they had koalas in Tasmania. They don't, but they do have a fine assortment of Tasmanian devils there, so we just took the two and spliced their genes together. That doesn't sound very legal. Nor moral, but we do it anyway because that's the kind of guys we are. Insane? No, more like animal lovers with an evil streak down the middle. So I assume it has a specialized diet then? French toast. Really? French toast? That's sort of unexpected. No, wait, wait, wait. That's, that, uh... No, I've got that wrong. That's the hammerhead corgi piranha we made last week. Oh. No, this is uh, raw meat wrapped in eucalyptus leaves. Uh, can I get that somewhere? Alpo makes its own brand of really? it. Really? I, I really don't about. think that's true. I, no, I just, no. Something tells no, me I, I have a can meat. right here. See, it's uh, Alpo Tasmanian Koala. Ciao. Uh, yeah, that can is actually a can of Alpo beef chunks with the words uh, Tasmanian Koala Chow written in mm. with a laundry 
Laundry Marker. Yes, well, it is a specialty brand, you know. They make a very limited run of it, so naturally they can't afford to have labels printed yeah. up. Uh, or... So what other unusual animals might you have, oh, and, you know, and just in well, case I don't want to deal with the uh, dietary concerns of a Tasmanian koala. Well, it is one of our more advanced pets, yes. Now, let's see, what have I got around here? Uh, Eurasian cat scorpions. Uh-huh. We've got some tusked geese. Yes, uh, we have uh... a crocodile. No, wait, that's on reserve for Kirk Cameron. I kind um, of figured there. Does that eat bananas, by the way? Only gay bananas. I didn't know you could sex a banana. Well, any answer to that question would be fairly obvious and quite rude, so mm. I'm just going to stay out of that part of town if you don't mind. Yeah, it's probably for the best. If you don't uh, mind my asking, uh, who is this pet for? Is it for you? Uh, it's for a girl it... I'm trying to impress. You know, she's uh, sort of got well, a thing Well, I'm thinking going, that these yeah. genetic monstrosities might be more likely to horrify her than impress her. Well, she does have a thing for animals, though. She does like them Well, very these much. are animals only in the loosest definition of the words, I'll uh, have you know. Well, Not to mention extremely expensive and very yeah. high maintenance. Are you yes. sure this girl is worth it? Well, I'm trying to sort of give her a gift in sort of an exchange for a gift she gave me last week. Well, yeah, like I'm said, thinking maybe more of a parakeet would be along the lines of... Hold on. Huh? Oh. So anyway, as I was saying, perhaps you'd like something less advanced, you Do know? all the pets go the... silent all the time in here? That's yeah, it's some sort weird. of side effect from the drugs we give them. I'm not sure what causes that. It's yeah. just the, the ammo overhead alone is breaking us, i got to say. Yeah, I noticed well, all the bullet holes in the ceiling yes. like that. That's pretty... Uh... Uh, so what kind of gift did she give you that you'd want to repay her with one of these blasphemies of nature? Uh, she gave me herbs. Herbs. Yeah. Like, um, it was a big bouquet of herbs, you know, it was like oregano and mint and chives. And mostly it was uh, wrapped around with a big thing of thyme. And, she uh, gave you that as a gift then? Yeah, when I was visiting her last week. So I just, you know. Thought and you want to repay uh, her with a $35,000 genetic freak? Yeah, mm. I think so. Those must have been some pretty spectacular herbs. Oh, the best. No better time than the present. Well, the animals around here really don't like puns, do they? No, that's another side effect of the drugs, and they're all glaring at you. I think perhaps you better leave before you get torn to shreds. Yes, well, thanks for all your help, then. Not at all, sir. Now get out of here, you weed. Honestly, some customers. Hey there! Welcome to the Pet Emporium, sir. Can I help you? Yeah, you got any goldfish? Well, that depends on you, sir. Would you like a goldfish that's covered with poisonous spikes, has six eyes, and is the size of a canned ham? What eye? And so the strange disheveled man bought the goldfish and lived happily ever after, which in his case was six minutes, which was approximately about the time it took for the goldfish's poison to liquefy his pancreas. The end. Just how dangerous are these bees anyway, Professor? Killer bees are the most dangerous in the world, General. They're relentless in their one single-minded objective to kill their target, and they will, even if it means ending their own lives. What, you mean? Yes, they'll kill themselves just to sting you, Captain. I thought all bees died when they stung you. No, just killer bees. When normal honeybees sting you, they're so remorseful, they die of a broken heart. Duh! Yes, I know, it is sad, isn't it? So, General... I'm the professor, you're the general. So, Professor, what you're saying is these are suicide bees? That's right, Professor, I mean general. So these are jihadist bees? Well, if that's what you want to call them. Let's call them bee-hardists! You know, I don't care if you're a general and I'm a civilian. If you ever say anything like that again, I'll punch you right in the face. Court-martial or not, I'm with him, sir. All right, all right, sorry. The general, the captain, the scientist, and the other guy fighting for a world where they won't all be killed by bees. Mr. President, this is a crisis situation. I understand, general. Now, professor, how are we going to defeat these bees? Mr. President, I think we can defeat them with science. Sounds dandy. How much science will you need? As much of it as we can spare, sir. Captain, how much science does America have? We have most of it, sir. Well, guess what? We're good to go, then. This summer, the ultimate showdown between bees and science. Detective Pictures presents the swarm of deadly killer bees. This week's episode of Technical Difficulties is brought to you by a black void of existential despair, where nothing you do or say matters. There is only futility. Your life is naught but passing as a specter through this veil of pain. And then, oblivion. That's the Black Void of Existential Despair. Available wherever products are sold to overly sensitive people. One Black Void of Existential Despair, please. Sorry, we're fresh out. How will I face the cruel night alone? I'll toughen up, Loretta. (laughs) All right. That'll learn him. Hey, Pops. Hey's for horses, ass bite. Yes, it's that time again. Time for Pops Corner Store, where urban Joes come in with their so-called modern problems and get served a big heapin' helpin' of common sense from a crusty old storekeeper. Let's see what the cantankerous old rascal is up to this week. Well, what do you want? Well, Pops, my son is whining at me about getting one of them newfangled video game systems. What the hell do you want to get him one of those for so he can sit around and rot his brain and get fat in front of a TV set? Those things are notorious electricity hogs. And 
for what? So he can pretend to be a gang member? When I was his age, I didn't have these games. I had to go out and join a real gang. Here, he doesn't need one of those. Give him this. It's a 9mm semi-automatic. And here, here's a crib sheet full of gang hand signals. Have him join a real gang and get some exercise, learn about the free market, and get some valuable life lessons. So what if it costs him 10 years and the clink gets worth it? Thanks, Pops. That really puts things in perspective. Get the hell out of my store! <laughs> Next! And that's the whole story. Thanks to Dad and some sound advice from Pops, they did a nickel in Attica. And that's where you found the Lord. Actually, that was a few years later. And there you are, folks. Another inspiring tale of the healing power of Jesus. I wasn't done yet. Feel the healing power of Jesus. But, uh, ow! All right, I'm going, jeez! Up next, the story of a nymphomaniac who felt the Holy Spirit come upon her. And I wish my deacons would proofread these before they let me read them on the air. Tonight at 9, Homo Patrol, the story of two-fisted gays in the military. Private, that was the bravest thing I've ever seen. Oh, come on, General, it was just a Taliban machine gun nest. For a good-looking ripped soldier like me, it was nothing. Even so, I'll see you get medals for this. Oh, I'm looking forward to having the General decorate my chest. Then at 9, Murder in the First, the story of a mystery writer who solves murders in her small, sleepy New England town. We found her body washed up on the shore. She'd been stabbed to death with a shark. Uh, Aye, yeah. so you think it was murder then, Mrs. Murder Salva? Yes, just like the other 153 murders that have happened in this town recently. Is there anyone even left alive in this place? Just the two of us, and I'd watch your P's and Q's if I were you. It's my name over the title, you know. Then at nine, Tiger Fighters! Look out, Joe! Tigers! How the hell do they keep getting in here? I don't know, Joe, but looks like we got our work cut out for us. Yeah, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Then at nine, Ghost Lawyers! Then at nine, Ninja Tornado Chasers! Then at nine, Stripper Patrol! It's at nine! Watch it at nine! Nine o'clock! It's the greatest hour of television in the history of the world! Watch it at nine for the love of God! Tune in at 9 at 9 o'clock! So thank you so much. Be back here next time as we finish the Tech Diff Super Clip. Be sure to write in with your iTunes for a review. Follow us on Facebook. And on Twitter. And, of course, doing the usual with sending uh, smoke signals or carrier pigeons to Jack Ward, Nova Scotia, Canada. <laughs> That's right. And check out all the great stories about audio drama on the Sonic Society website at, at sonicsociety.org. Absolutely. So, for the Sonic Society this week, I'm Jack Ward. And I'm David Alt. Good night. And good night. The Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening.